Okay, uh, thank you. I'm Simon Perkins, and I'm going to be talking about HTTP Watch. Uh, you've heard it mentioned already. You might be wondering what it is. Um, well, it's a commercial HTTP sniffer for Internet Explorer and Firefox, but it also includes a log file viewer that enables you to open up log files that you previously recorded in HTTP Watch, and now it can also open up um, HAR files that may have been recorded in other tools as well. So you can find out more about HTTP Watch at httpwatch.com. Uh, um, I've got uh, less than seven minutes to go through seven uh, new features in version seven that we released on the 7th of June of this month. So uh, let's get cracking. Uh, first off, in, um, I've got Firefox uh, here. I've installed HTTP Watch. It adds an icon down in the status bar. And I'm going to record uh, a log for a site. Let's try the... Um, SSL version of the Google home page that's currently in beta. And uh, I just wanted to, to do that uh, to show you that it, it works with uh, SSL. Um, and I'm going to use one of those new features now. I'm going to increase the size of the font in the main grid, which is handy if you're doing a demo like this. It just makes it a little bit larger, scales everything up. Uh, because I'm going to talk about the waterfall time chart uh, that was generated. It's very similar to the waterfall time charts that you'll see in, in other programs. It's the same as it was in the previous version of HTTP Watch. Uh, but new in this version, we've added the uh, browser level events. So here's the, the DOM load event, um, the uh, render start that indicates uh, when the browser started to paint the new page. The uh, page load event is uh, sitting at, um, back here. Um, and uh, this information um, is available in other tools, you know, for example, in Firebug. But what makes HTTP Watch different is that we have this level of integration in more than one browser, well, in two browsers. So we also support Internet Explorer. So that might be uh, useful if you want to do a like-for-like -like comparison uh, across more than one browser. So I'm going to um, start off Internet Explorer here. Um, I've opened up the HTTP watch window. It's exactly the same. It's got the same user interface. It's got the same functionality. And I'm going to uh, run a test on that same uh, web page. So you can see it's generated a, a very similar um, chart um, with page events, um, as we saw in Firefox. So here's the render start and the page load. There is one difference here. There's no DOM load event because there's no direct equivalent uh, currently of the DOM content uh, loaded uh, event in, in IE. So that's the reason why that's not there uh, currently. Um, what else is new? Oh, well, one of the um, major features that uh, we've added um, is the detection of potential uh, problems as we're recording log files. Uh, you can see here as I hold the, uh, the mouse pointer over um, this request. In fact, all of the requests have been flagged. It's uh, behaving differently, again, behind the, the proxy here. But, um, we automatically detect um, potential performance problems, and we've taken a, a different approach here to the other tools like YSlow and PageSpeed. Rather ha than having an overall uh, performance ranking, we've gone for this sort of low-level approach to highlight the requests that require some attention. Those other tools do a great job at uh, providing a, a performance ranking. Um, it, it's not really up to us to provide yet another uh, index. So uh, if I click on the request here, it gives me a list of the warnings that were detected. I mean, in this case, we've got the first two um, warnings are uh, related to um, performance. Just watching the time here. Um, I haven't got time to, to go into um, what those warnings actually mean. They're very similar to the rules built into other tools like uh, YSlow and um, PageSpeed. Um, but the, the difference in HTTP Watch is that we've also added other types of warnings as well, not di directly related to performance, although they could have an impact. If I go to the Tools Warnings window, there's a complete list of all the warnings that we support in HTTP Watch. There's, there's currently about 20 that that number will grow. Uh, the first set of warnings uh, relate to performance. And as I said before, they're very similar to the rules in, in other tools. Uh, the next group of warnings are related to security. So we look for things like um, unsecured resources being used on a secure page. And that might lead to a security warning in the browser when you access that page. We look for opportunities to improve the security of cookies by using the secure and HTTP-only um, flags on them. And the final set of warnings are related to functionality. So we look for things that might potentially break the page or affect its um, behavior within the browser. For example, not redirecting after um, posting um, a, a form back to the server. 
Um, we look for things like, um, is the server date and time, does it look like it's being set incorrectly? So there's, there's a list of the warnings there. You can uh, disable those warnings. Maybe you're not, not interested in a certain warning, or maybe it applies to a third-party component over which you've got no control. Okay, um, how are we doing? One minute left, uh, just over. Um, one of the other major areas, uh, as Steve mentioned, of development uh, uh, with HTTP Watch was um, working on the initial um, Haas spec uh, with the guys on the Firebug team. And I just wanted to show you uh, what you can do with that. Um, I previously recorded a, a file, um, a HAR file, using Firebug and the Net panel. I did an export. And so I've got this HAR file here. If you install HTTP Watch, you can just double click on that file, open it up, and you get the same functionality as the rest of HTTP Watch. You get the same time charts. You should get uh, the same warnings being displayed because you've got the same underlying data. Now, the warnings aren't uh, stored away in the half file. We just read the data in, and then we apply our algorithm to the data as it's read in. All right, so very similar functionality to the rest of HTTP Watch. You could um, open up another log file that you recorded in HTTP Watch and view it alongside. So you could quickly switch between something that was recorded in Firebug or another tool and compare that to a log file that was recorded in HTTP Watch. OK, so i better start to wrap up. We've got about um, 30 seconds left here. Just a, a couple of other features you might be interested in. You can now choose the columns that are displayed uh, in the main grid. Um, there's about 35 different uh, pieces of data that can now be directly added. Uh, that could be useful if you were trying to track down some sort of uh, caching problem. You might be interested in adding the expires header directly as a column. And I think with that, I've just about run out of time. Uh, thanks for your time. And if you'd like to know any more, please visit httpwatch.com. Thanks, Steve. Anybody ever heard of web page test here? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> this is the, uh, the third year I've demoed web page test at Velocity. And I have to say that the uptick in usage we've seen between last year and this year is just phenomenal. It's really gratifying to see it used so widely. So for those who aren't familiar with it, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background. It's, uh, it was originally developed at AOL to, as the basis for some of our internal testing. Developed by Pat Meenan, created and maintained by. And it was uh, open sourced a couple of years ago, three years ago. And then right before the first Velocity, uh, the first hosted version of it. So it's available as both a hosted version and a, a desktop module you can plug into IE. It's also, the hosted version is also available as a, a, a package that you can install behind your own firewall if you want to do your own private testing. Some of the features, real quickly, uh, it does web page load times in uh, IE 7 and 8. The desktop version also does 6, but the hosted version just 7 and 8. Uh, it provides object timing and detailed information, as well as visualizations, waterfalls, different uh, charts showing connection diagrams and so forth. Uh, it allows you to test at multiple connection types and locations. So you can test at broadband speed, you can test at DSL speed, you can test in different geographic locations to see how that impacts your site. Uh, it suggests optimization. It, 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 similar to the YSLOW rules and page feed rules, there are several checks that it makes and suggestions that it makes on how you can improve your page. And every test result is saved historically and with, with a unique URL to those results. So uh, you can track your performance over time. You can share those results with other people. So what's new? More test locations. Last year, there were two test locations. This year, we have seven today. Probably another month, there'll be half a dozen more. We've gotten a lot of people committed at this conference to hosting new locations. So there's a lot of different places domestically as well as internationally you can test from now. Uh, custom bandwidth configuration. In the past, there were several predefined bandwidth characteristics you could test with. Now you can set your own. You can define up upstream, downstream bandwidth, latency, packet loss, etc. cetera. Uh, there's additional resource utilization available. It shows uh, a browser a CPU utilization overlaid with waterfall diagrams as well as the network bandwidth occurring overlaid with waterfall diagrams. And the biggest new feature that we've gotten a lot of interest in is the visual comparisons. This allows us to supplement the traditional metrics of page load times with some other information that gives a better indication of the, the perceived performance that the user sees, when something's visible on the screen, when it finishes loading, that type of thing, visually. 
uh, in, in two forms, a film strip view and a full motion video, and I'll demonstrate that in a little while. Uh, and lastly, uh, the ability to export data to the HAR file format, the HTTP archive that Simon mentioned. So last year I covered a lot of uh, the basic functionality pretty in depth, and I'm not going to repeat that here. All that information is available in last year's presentation, so this year I'm just going to focus on the new stuff. So when you start a test, this is what you see. You uh, enter the URL you want to test, you select the, the location you want to test from, and you can pick one of the predefined uh, browser and connection type combinations. Or the new functionality, you can uh, create your own bandwidth characteristics. Again, defining uh, the bandwidth in both directions, the latency as well as a packet loss you want to, to simulate. Uh, here's an example of uh, the new resource utilization that is shown along with the waterfall diagram. Here's a snippet of a waterfall diagram and we can see that uh, near the end of the page load we've, we've got uh, the blue vertical line is the document complete line uh, and we see a big gap in the waterfall there. What's causing that? You know, why is this happening? Well, if we look at the CPU utilization during that spike, we see that uh, it's 100%, it's maxed out. So generally that indicates that there's a uh, JavaScript executing and, and blocking user interaction. So the user experience in this case is dot .complete was reached, the page is visible on the user's screen, but they can't interact with it for seven seconds while something is happening. So not a great user experience. Now here's the real cool stuff, the visual comparison. There's two ways to, to do this. Uh, you can enter a, a series of URLs and kick off a video comparison. Or there's a set of predefined tests of standard websites that you can just check a box. And these are run periodically, so you'll be seeing the results of, of the standard runs. The, when the, the, the standard interface for the visual comparisons or the simple interface uh, uses some standard configurations. Uh, every test is run three times in a, in a first view or empty cache configuration is run from Dulles, Virginia at DSL speeds. Uh, the median run is used for the comparison purposes and, and the results are publicly available. But if you don't like those standard configuration or standard options, you can configure a test as normal using that initial screen that I showed. And then uh, there's a, a set of options at the bottom of that main page, and in the video, on the video tab, there's a little checkbox for capturing video, so just check that. And then later, you view the, uh, the test history, and for all the, the tests that have video, you can see that indicated by a little video in parentheses there. You just add a checkbox next to those and click the compare button. And what does it look like? Well, there's a couple of views. There's this film strip view. So this is like watching, uh, uh, seeing a film strip laid out on the table. Now, in this example, I want to demonstrate how uh, some of the metrics that we see don't always equate to what the user experience is. Both of the websites shown here have a render start time according to the metrics of one and a half seconds. But if we look closely at that period of time in the film strip, uh, at one and a half seconds, both sites have essentially put a background image up. If we look further down the film strip, we see that the first site has fully rendered the content by five or six seconds, whereas the second site shows, continues to show a blank screen or just that background image until almost six seconds. Uh, so quite a different user experience. Some more options uh, from this film strip view, you can uh, click on the labels and, and get directly to the waterfall diagrams. You can change the granularity of the, of the time axis, you can change the size of the uh, thumbnails, and you can create a full motion video. So let me just uh, demonstrate that quickly. So this can be a very powerful tool in, in demonstrating performance. Uh, we also support the HTTP archive format to export data into, and, and I'm uh, running out of time here, so I'm just going to jump through this. More information about that format there. Uh, it's supported in a bunch of tools, including ours. Uh, what is next? A new re UI redesign by real UI designers, funded by Newstar. So a big shout out for Newstar for supporting that. The ability to uh, view the film strip view and a waterfall diagram at the same time and scroll through them so you can see where you are in the uh, waterfall diagram, with, uh, align that visually with your film strip view. More test locations coming all over the world. Uh, the ability to, in to import the HAR format and uh, integration and standardization with other tools for information interchange. Thank you very much, and we're hiring. 
Yes, so uh, I've only got seven minutes, so I'll just jump right into the demo. So what is Speed Tracer? Uh, Speed Tracer is a performance monitoring tool for Chrome that focuses on the runtime responsiveness of your application. So you open Speed Tracer, which is a Chrome extension, by the way, is by clicking on uh, this green stopwatch. Speed Tracer is, is going to be monitoring uh, right away. So all you have to do is navigate to your application, and uh, data should flow into Speed Tracer. So like most tools, Speed Tracer will tell you when the page loaded. You can zoom in. Uh, Speed Tracer will tell you how long uh, you were blocking the browser's UI thread, and it'll give you a breakdown of uh, what exactly the browser was doing while the UI thread was blocked. Uh, like other tools, uh, we'll give you hints on how to make your page load faster. These hints should look familiar to you because uh, most of these were actually derived from uh, the page speed rules. Okay, so the main uh, component of the Speed Tracer UI is this uh, timeline. Uh, this timeline shows uh, uh, dispatches off of the uh, UI threads uh, event loop in the browser. So the browser is single threaded and all the work happens in little nuggets um, that get pumped when the UI event loop uh, gets pumped. So I can zoom out in Speed Tracer. Uh, this app is really fast, so there's not much going on, but I can zoom in, and I notice there's an XHR somewhere here. Okay, here. So there's an, X, uh, an XHR ready state change. So I can drill into this, and I can see it's a ready state change to four. Uh, I see it ran a JavaScript callback, and uh, I notice that it tickled the HTML parser. So, you know, we thought it would be nice that when the browser is, you know, running layout or style recalculations or, or, and so on synchronously from JavaScript to be able to see what JavaScript caused that to happen. So if you click on one of these uh, parse HTML nodes, we actually give you a stack trace. So if you click on this, it'll tell you, well, apparently setting inner HTML will trigger the HTML parser, obviously. Uh, as you can see, this is a, a obfuscated or compiled JavaScript. In particular, this is a GWT application. Staring at compiled obfuscated JavaScript is not very useful most of the time, uh, unless you know, you're a, a super JavaScript ninja. Um, so Speed Tracer has built-in support for uh, a re-symbolization protocol to map from obfuscated JavaScript back to your original source language. In this case, a GWT app, so we have uh, a Java class name and uh, a function name. Uh, because I have the Google plugin for Eclipse installed, if I click on this, it takes me right into my IDE and I can see that it's running the constructor for clip state. All right. So uh, the next feature I'd like to show you is our network view. So most tools uh, for performance monitoring, obviously, have the familiar network waterfall. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, Speed Tracer focused mainly on client-side rendering uh, performance. But the performance of web applications obviously does not solely depend on client-side rendering in JavaScript. There's a server. So uh, on our network view, we have support for uh, another protocol for uh, associating server-side traces uh, with each network request. So in this case, uh, this is the sticky notes application. So uh, this request invoked the sticky service. And uh, you can see it had one really fast uh, memcache to get. So it's a pretty fast application, but it's nice to, 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 to validate that uh, the time on the server was only 15 milliseconds. The rest of it was uh, network latency. All right, so that's our network view. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show you is uh, uh, the ability to save trace data. So if you get a bug report in the wild um, uh, for some you know, mythical hard to reproduce performance regression, uh, uh, it's very nice to have one of these things attached to your bug report. So a user in the wild could notice that clicking on uh, the save button is really slow. He can uh, save you a speed tracer uh, uh, a dump file save it to disk, attach it to a bug report, and then your performance guru can then uh, open this up in the browser. And he can see the exact same uh, performance trace that your user was seeing, and you can see in the same UI. Um, that's pretty much it for my demo. I kind of went really fast, because I assumed seven minutes would uh, go back very fast. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be manning the Google booth later today at 3.30. Um, I'll be doing some more demos, and I'll be uh, kind of going in-depth on how uh, the re protocol works and how uh, the server-side traces work. So if you want to build uh, some APIs to kind of uh, bake your server-side tracing information into Speed Tracer, um, come talk to me then. Thank you.
Thanks, Steve. It's good to be back. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people have used Fiddler before? How many people have used it in the last year or so? Okay, good. So basically, over the last two years, most of the improvements in Fiddler have been taking place kind of under the cover. So improving the fidelity, improving the performance, uh, improving the ability to simulate certain conditions and so forth. Um, but there's also been some new features that are particularly relevant for folks uh, in this room. And so I'm going to spend the next uh, six minutes and 40 seconds talking about those features. So the first thing to mention uh, actually isn't really directly related to Fiddler at all. And that's about essentially the uh, platform preview build for, for Internet Explorer. Uh, so Internet Explorer's platform pre preview build number three shipped uh, yesterday, and uh, we introduced, uh, in, our, in our IE9 builds, we introduced a new network debugging tab. And so you can see that if you hit the F12 developer tools, and you can just click Start Capturing. And so, you know, if I go and, and run in one of the, uh, one of the demos, I want to load something that's going to be pretty fast on, on this network. Uh, so let's do the fish tank and see how that goes. Uh, as you open up the IE developer tools, you can see that, you know, here's your, your typical waterfall diagram. Well, the key thing about the waterfall diagram, uh, beyond, you know, the fact that this may be enough for, for some lightweight needs, is it has the ability to export captured traffic. And the export format is uh, based on an XML serialization of the HAR file format. You can see that we're downloading, uh, I think, a giant uh, video here. Um, but the key thing now is, is that you can actually import that, that format into Fiddler and analyze it. So even when you're not running Fiddler on the client, you have the ability to collect traffic. Uh, and so Fiddler will import both the JSON format, which is the JSON serialization, uh, which is exported by other tools for, for the HTTP archive, as well as the XML serialization exported by the IE9 tools. Uh, you can also, of course, import Fiddler's native Session Archive zip format. Session Archive zip is a complete capture of the traffic, including all of the data, images, and so forth. Uh, and so this can be useful for certain scenarios when you need to be able to precisely reconstruct something. And you can also export from Fiddler. And so you can export into the 1.1 HAR format, the 1.2 HAR format, which contains more data about binary resources. You can export a Visual Studio web test. So Visual Studio uh, introduced a web test feature in 2005 and continues to improve. And so you can export scripts out of Fiddler for that. Uh, WCAT is an IS load to test tool, and you can build a script with Fiddler for that. Uh, and then you can also just dump raw files. Now, the key part about all of this is it's pluggable. And so if you've got your own format or you want to innovate and create a new tool that has sort of a new set of requirements, you can build your own exporters for Fiddler. And Fiddler, generally speaking, I call it a web debugging platform because virtually everything in Fiddler uh, is extensible. And that's largely because it's used by a wide variety of people for a wide variety of reasons. The next thing I wanted to mention that a lot of people don't know about is a tool called FiddlerCap. So FiddlerCap is designed for non-technical users to capture things in the field. And so this is available and it's used by teams like the Zune team and the Hotmail team and so forth where the user encounters some problem on a website, the web developer says, man, I really wish I knew what was going on in this user's machine. Sometimes that, that's not possible. Previously we told them, hey, go install Fiddler, click here, click here, click here, click here. But the idea of FiddlerCap is it's a lightweight way, it's literally you push three buttons. You push start, you go do whatever's broken, you push stop, you push save, you get a SAS file out and you can email that to uh, a web debugger for analysis. Uh, a new feature of that is, is that it's now available in four languages, and I imagine there will be more later. Uh, it's available in Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Japanese, and, and English. Uh, and so if you have a problem with a user uh, that you need to, to look at what's going on, just tell them to go to fiddlercap.com, and there's a little set of instructions. It's about a 300K download, uh, and it'll collect data out of any browser that supports a proxy. Uh, by default, all, proxy, all browsers will hook to the, the system proxy with the exception of Firefox. For Firefox, there's a browser plugin for that. A new feature that was requested by some of the folks here and in the past is uh, the ability to run side-by-side -side instances of Fiddler for comparison. And so basically you just add the, the dash viewer command line parameter and you can open multiple copies of Fiddler where you can compare captures in the timeline view and, and, and so forth. Uh, and then the other thing that's pretty new is there's an extension for Fiddler called Differ. And what Differ does is it allows you to do side-by-side -side lightweight comparisons of traffic captures. And so the idea here is, is if you've got two HAR files and you want to see, well, wait a minute, what's different? You know, this one was captured in Firefox, this one was captured in IE, and drag one to the left one, drag one to the right one, and then you can do, basically, you'll get a quick, quick analysis of how many requests and what size were they and so forth. Uh, but you can also do a more in-depth analysis and compare individual files and WinDiff between them. Uh, this is still a fairly new extension, but I imagine it's going to get more powerful because this is a scenario that's interesting to a lot of people. 
Steve had mentioned yesterday it would be really cool if you could replay a HAR file. Uh, Fiddler has this capability. You can replay captured traffic. Uh, with HAR files, one key point is, is that the 1.1 one -one format only maintains textual information. It doesn't, in particular, maintain binary information like images. The 1.2 one -two format includes those binaries that are serialized in base64. And so uh, you can replay those with higher fidelity because the images and so forth will be present. You can also use the, the SAS format, which is uh, generated by Fiddler and Fiddler Cap, and you can play those back. And so you can, so you can basically replay what the user got on their side. Uh, today, this doesn't support latency that's captured in the trace, uh, but it probably will by the weekend. It's a, it's a very simple thing to add. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is we've made some changes to caching in Internet Explorer 9, and basically we're doing a better job of capturing uh, caching information, particularly for resources uh, that fail to follow best practices. So there's heuristic expiration. They don't tell us when it expires. Uh, we're becoming more aggressive about caching in line with the specification. Well, the caching analyzer in Fiddler will take a look at a, a given response and tell you essentially, here's why it's being cached or here's why it's not being cached. If there's no information, here's how long browsers will typically cache the information. And then the very last thing I wanted to mention is, is that there's a, about a, six months ago, I released Fiddler Core. Fiddler Core is a .NET class library that you can actually build into your application. There's no UI, but it supports essentially the full proxy architecture. You get callbacks anytime there's an HTTP request. Uh, it can parse the bodies for you. It can return the headers. Uh, you can serialize this out. You know, you can serialize to a SAS format or a database. And this is really useful for folks who want to uh, put this into their test architecture, uh, capture things, you know, every time they run a test in their lab, they capture all the traffic to the database so they can later go back and see what goes wrong. Um, everything on orange on the slide is a place that you can either write your own code or, or host, uh, you know, the green, the green stuff essentially is the stuff that, that Fiddler provides and the orange code is stuff that you can write. And so Fiddler is extremely extensible even without hosting Fiddler Core, but this is something that's gaining a lot of interest. And uh, I believe that that's all I've got. Thanks so much.